The Early Years of Salt in St. Clair. In 1863, a group of St. Clair men hired F. Spangler to drill for brine deposits thought to lie underground in the St. Clair area. Some months later, in June 1861, there was a well producing one barrel of brine every five minutes. This venture was never profitable and was abandoned. During this time in the United States, most dairy and table salt was coming from Europe. In the early 1880s, the old well was cleaned out and again an effort was made to recover brine. However, it also was not successful. The general manager still believed in it and convinced Crockett McElroy that they had technology to go deeper than others were go than others were going locally. McElroy, though a resident of St. Clair, decided to drill in Marine City. Mining and salt wells are two ways of getting salt from below. Water is pumped down, mixes with the salt, forming a brine, which is then pumped back up. St. Clair only uses wells. There are mines below Detroit. For a well, water is pumped down, it dissolves, and mixes with the salt, forming a brine, which is then pumped back up. In St. Clair in 1884, the Thompson Brothers Salt Company used this technology. Am I echoing? No. Okay. The Thompson Brothers Salt Company. See the horse? 1897 plat map, map showing Thompson Brothers Salt. There by the, it looks like it'd be the north side of Pine River. No, 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 the south side. The Pine River's coming in that way. Okay, okay. The good old days. Thompson Salt Block. The boats Pilgrim and Douglas, owned by Thompson Brothers Salt, <coughs> ply between Detroit and Alpena. Diamond crystal can be seen in the background. Diamond Crystal Salt Company. 23 years after St. Clair Salt Works was started, on April 10, 1886, St. Clair Rock Salt Company was organized. Executives and board members were Mark Hops. Hopkins, Justin Whiting, Franklin Moore, Charles F. Moore, son of Reuben Moore. And that, Char that Charles F. Moore is the grandfather of the Charles F. Moore we knew. Even with improved drilling technology, the first year the wells produced only 75 wooden barrels per day, 280 pounds each, with sales that year of $18,000 and no profits. Charles Moore poses with the workers, 1890. The Allberger process was invented and patents by John Allberger, Louis Allberger, and Horace Williams. Prior to 1865, all evaporated salt was made either in open pans or by solar process. The Allberger method involved heating brine under pressure. When the pressure was released, tiny cubes formed and grew into delicate flake-like salt crystals on the surface of the brine in the open pans. This process, though expensive, produced the salt with great purity and was readily soluble because of its unique flake structure. In an effort to emphasize the purity of this premium product, on May 1, 1886, the name was changed from St. Clair Rock Salt Company to Diamond Crystal Salt Company. There's three refining methods. Anyway, we won't read all that. <laughs> Those important ones. To better understand the importance of the purity of Diamond Crystal Salt, it helps to understand how the 1886 patented Allberger process works. And there's a bunch of diagrams. 
The two guys that worked in the plant, you understand it. It starts out where the um, the brine is pumped into the heaters, and the temperature is raised. The boiler room used 200 tons of coal every 24 hours in the early days. Then the brine was uh, sent to the graveler. The graveler had stones in it that would. Um, that the impurities would attach themselves to. Then after that, the brine was sent to the open pans. Down below, the picture on the right is um, what just partial of a pan looked like, and then up above is a more recent evaporator pan. And then from there, it went into the centrifugal uh, separator, which is basically like your spin cycle on your washing machine. Then it went through a rotary dryer and into the sorter. So it could be sorted out for different, um, different types of salt, from the smallest for, for baking and um, mixes, and that up to larger salt, and up to the kosher salt. A shaker girl was added to the packaging to focus on purity of diamond crystal salt. This cutaway pipe shows the layers of buildup impurities, including copper and iron, that is removed from the salt brine. Gypsum is the number one component in raw salt that is extracted from the brine. Now you've heard of gypsum. Right? Yes, the key component in drywall and fertilizers. Who wants to consume that? <laughs> Not all salt is processed using the Alberger method. Salt for industry and it home use does not need purification. So this salt can be shoveled and walked on. Good old winter time. There's some modern transportation. <laughs> About 1910, it says Milo Wilson, Henry Mayhew, Russell Brusco, Frank Yakum, and Bob Randall. Well, there's their names. About 1910, imagine. They worked hard to get salt those days. Barrels were used to ship salt, and of course they made the barrels right at the diamond. These barrels were made in the plant in the Cooper shop. We don't know the names of these men. The warehouse. I have a wooden bench at home that I was told made at the diamond, so my wooden bench is old. at that time, back in the day with the barrels? No. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yes, the Handy Brothers Railroad, which oh, was okay. the original name of the PH&D, uh, I think arrived in the late 1920s. Mm -hmm. uh, the barrels lasted into the early 50s. Wow. Since they did a lot of their own uh, work there, they had quite an extensive tool room. And there's another little post picture of these worker guys taking a break from making barrels. <laughs> yeah. 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 These are people that worked in the Cooper department. 1914, we've got a, a Jim Christie, a F. Stein, H. Lively, uh, W. Goulet, uh, Radamasher, Fulton, Bansney, Bonnie, Milo Wilson, Lee Boucher, Moses Christie, Bonnie, Sean Weber, Christie, Russo, Duchesne, and Chauvin. This is a great picture because a lot of the guys are smiling. Yeah, and yeah. They, yeah, they're so serious in those other pictures, but these guys look pretty happy. Mm -hmm. And this guy looks so real happy. Yeah. <laughs> we need to ship them out somewhere. We, we do have a, uh, one of the barrels in the Diamond Crystal Salt Room upstairs uh, on display, so you're welcome to take a look at it if you haven't seen one. For many years, salt was packed by hand into cloth sacks or pockets, which in turn were packed into the wooden barrels for shipment. So you see a couple of people there that were packing the salt. There's a turtle-like picture that's not cleaned up. <laughs> And the ladies at the sewing machines, um, mm -hmm. stitching up the bags. Mm -hmm. they're, they're all their hair, their hair up. Skirts, dresses, can you imagine working like that these days? Mm -hmm. Days of cash, I don't think we have even, even casual Friday anymore. Casual all the time. <laughs> oh, that's a queen. Oh. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they had a, a, this improvement with a uh, neater, more efficient automatic weighing and sewing machine. Look at the nice pile of bags. Yeah. <laughs> there she is. There, there's, there's the reality. <laughs> can identify um, some of the other relatives. What's actually this, I think it's this picture here. If you look at the St. Clair High School graduating class from the year before, mm -hmm. a lot of the same girls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
the lady, the lady on the lower row, the row, the second one from the left, she has something under her eye, and I don't know if, what oh. that is. You know, so that's why I recognized her as as a lot of. Uh, mm -hmm. And some more ladies from, now this is a later period, 1928, which you can tell by the, the dresses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like how the girls are holding hands. Yeah. <laughs> and this, they're making the, the round hand for the salt that the machine is making those. Um, brown cans are now made in Chatham, Ontario. <coughs> yeah, look, that floor looks pretty clean too, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. that one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Zimmer, Grace Morgan, and they woven yeah. on the round can line in their dresses and aprons. Mm -hmm. In a tour in 1946, mm -hmm. oh, oh, was that like a public tour maybe? Um, yeah, because mm -hmm. there's other pictures of it too. And there's kids yeah. in it. Kids, yeah. I mean, that's how you definitely know mm -hmm. that it was a public yeah. tour versus <coughs> a corporate tour. Okay, we're going back to some more history of the diamond crystal salt. There was a fire in 1892 which destroyed most of the plant, and they um, had discussions about whether or not to rebuild it. But on April 4th, uh, the board voted to rebuild it, and a $15,000 loan from a Detroit bank was obtained by Charles Moore. The companies. Uh, retained its customers during this time because of their reputation for high quality of their product and their customer service. The company suffered another fire in 1894. The country was in a depression at that time but there was money that was found for the repairs and the company did survive. During the 1890s, the company purchased additional property. They drilled another well and then they installed um, Alberger heaters. They added more boilers and they built another building. So their, their company, um, the company uh, grew and uh, was solid and steady. By 1900, there were seven wells that had been drilled. Um, one well had a depth of 2,168 feet deep into a rock salt layer 250 feet th thick. In 1904, the company sales reached $420,000. Not many towns sported so many strange looking towers. Mm -hmm. um, the towers were torn down in the late 1940s. And this is a map showing the locations of some of the, some of the wells. And another view from, I guess from across Pine River. Mm -hmm. There. Who can name the people who had the boathouses there? Uncle Ray had one. Okay. <laughs> Uncle Ray, Ray Conlon had, had one. one. Neil. Gordy Wolven. Gordy Wolven. Camp Warwick and Todd Tebow. Yep. Rourke and Tebow. Yep. Clint Sherrill. Clint, Clint Sherrill. Yep. My father-in-law, Art Bonab. Mr. Ray that's the room. I think it's snow and ice. Oh, that's, so, yeah. that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's where the harbor is now. Yeah. What are the sand? Is that sand right no, there? It's snow. It could it's be snow. Snow. Yeah. snow. Then they had to get out of there when the harbor was being built. So then people went to the other side of the river by Pine Shores. 
April 23, 1908 issue of the St. Clair Republic and was devoted to the Salt <clears throat> Company, its history and products. The latest product was the shaker salt that had a spout for pouring salt into salt shakers instead of having to pour from a bag. 1908, a new office building was built. Only four years later, in 1912, a second floor was added to the office. That's where I would have started in 1957. Fred Moore and J.J. Gannon. Diamond Crystal Engineering Office. A little different looking than yours, huh, Mel Rogers? <laughs> Diamond Office Calisthenics, 1916. <laughs> They had to keep in shape. If you look at the picture on the upper right there, hanging on the wall, it's a shaker girl. Yeah. And actually, there was a um, there was a yard long, um, which is a yard long calendar from that era, and it sold on eBay for like nine hundred dollars. So, unfortunately, the museum did not get it. <laughs> Annie Kepsky? Yeah. 1952, and, and then another woman on the left in an old Remington typewriter. Some guy last night said that that was a mugshot. It was not a mugshot. <laughs> <laughs> I just like the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> By 1910, Diamond Crystal Salt Company was the only survivor of the three original salt producers in the area. Thompson Company, where the Alberger process had first been demonstrated, failed in 1906, and Morton Salt acquired their buildings. McElroy's closed down after a fire destroyed it in 1910. In 1913, Morton Salt, just up the road in Marysville, had a devastating fire. Um, Charles Moore hitched up his horse and went to see Joy Morton, the president and, and competitor, his competitor. He offered to add another shift to make extra barrels for Morton so he could continue to serve his customers, and the offer was accepted. So they were helping each other out in time of need. Well, the, the truth of the matter is that, oh. <laughs> that Joy Morton was the salesman for Diamond Crystal in their early days. And he left the company to start his own company, so he and Charles Moore were friends. We're friends. Yeah. In spite of the fact that Morton became a competitor. Yeah. Good to know. Oh, that is good to know. Um, I need your phone number. <laughs> <laughs> So later, when Diamond Crystal needed additional plant space, Morton returned the favor by agreeing to sell the block of Thompson buildings that Morton had acquired in 1906 uh, when Thompson closed down. So then you see Diamond Crystal on that map um, south of um, Pine River, that whole, that whole block. And you see Diamond Crystal owns um, up to the left of the Langell and Sons. So that might have yeah. been the other property that they acquired. And then that's the Oakland Hotel mm -hmm. on the left, right. close yeah. to the water. Mm -hmm. And of course, the cemetery. Charles F. Moore, founder of the company, retired in 1910. And his character was illustrated with that story that we just had about the helping out Morton Salt, um, which was published in the Centennial Booklet um, in uh, 1986. 
Henry Whiting, Diamond Crystal President from 1910 to 1926. I was president. Um, under his presidency, a chemist and an engineer were added to the staff to work on new and improved products and production methods. Quality control and research and development have been cornerstones of Diamond Crystal since the beginning. And there you see Burt Burles on the left and Art Stratton on the, uh, the right. And I did know Mr. Burles. <laughs> I graduated with his daughter, so I knew him. Quality control, um, also Carl Bankston and Art Stratton. A 1911 patent by engineer Charles Weil led to the development of the salt blocks made today and used throughout the livestock industry. But they aren't made here anymore. And then the culls were always thrown into the river, right? Right. The culls, the salt blocks that weren't perfect, they went in the river. Why not? You didn't put that in here, Mary. <laughs> I had to, had to ad lib that one. Diamond Crystal Plant, 1919. Okay, so we're going to Until the advent of reliable rail transportation from St. Clair in the mid-1920s, much of diamond crystal production was shipped by barge across the St. Clair River to the railhead at Courtright, Ontario. The Hilton St. Clair waits to be, waits to be loaded. Here the ferry welcome, ready to load salt at the diamond to take to Canada. The welcome was built by Simon Langell here in St. Clair. <laughs> there were more direct rail lines for shipment to Diamond Crystal's market area out of Courtright. The winter was a problem crossing the river. In the very early days, salt would be driven across with horse and sleigh. After a tug was kept, afterward, later, later, a tug was kept to break a path through the ice. Henry Whiting died in 1926, and succeeding him as president was Fred Moore, son of founder Charles Moore. Fred Moore was the third Diamond Crystal Salt Company president. 1927 boiler explosion. Brian Heaters. Floyd Wiswell Sr. was burned over 90% of his body. Clement Denemy and Peter Hythaler were also burned. Albert Studer died. The explosion caused heavy heat heater to shoot upward three stories, crushing through the crashing through the roof and shattering windows in the plant. Look at the cars. What year are they? <laughs> old. Yeah, they're old. <laughs> Since vacuum pan building, but I really can't read the rest. And here's the cathedral. They called it the cathedral. May of 1937. Looks like a, a church. There used to be two stair entrances to the tunnel, one north and one south. Only the south entrance remains today. 1921, Albert McKinnon and the tunnel under South Riverside with a train in the Sherman House in the background. There's more recent picture. Sam Crawford, local artist and Diamond Crystal employee, displayed many of his safety slogans in the tunnel on the tunnel walls in the 1950s and 60s. Because you'd walk through the tunnel and there was all these safety slogans. Sam Crawford had done. There are a lot of his pictures hanging over in the bar across the river. Okay. And there's a lot of Sam Crawford pictures here, too. These are the ones from Burkhardt's, the ones in this room. General Foods era. In an effort to diversify family holdings and strengthen the company, Diamond Crystal joined General Foods 
April 15, 1929, General Foods was a major DC customer. By the time the stock transfer was completed, the stock market had crashed and the Great Depression had begun. General Foods continued Diamond Crystal emphasis on quality and customer service, but had difficulty with understanding the complexities of the salt industry. By 1935, Diamond Crystal was losing $500,000 a year. General Foods brought in Fred Moore as general manager of Diamond Crystal and things gradually improved. Though profits didn't meet expectations, Diamond Crystal gained good experience and knowledge from General Foods in the administrative areas of job evaluation, accounting, marketing, uniform salary policies, and safety. 1945, General Foods acquired Colonial Salt in Akron, Ohio and changed the name to Diamond Crystal Colonial Salt Division of General Foods. In 1951, $100,000 was spent to install a fly ash arrestor to curb the problem of fly ash. It was, it was a problem for many years even after this. Um, the company used to pay area residents for house cleaning car cleaning because it would fly all over. Um, they went to um, somewhere, I have it here, they changed to butane fuel and um, propane at some point, um, which helped and then uh, recently, just within this past 2015-2016, uh, they went to natural gas. Um, in 1952, um, St. Clair Credit Union was formed for the benefit of Diamond Crystal employees, and it was um, originally located right in the plant with Clifford Jackson as board president. In the late 50s, it relocated to a building on Clinton Avenue and later to 3rd Street, which is the building that the veterinary is in right now. And. Um, then it went to uh, new offices out on Fredmore Highway. But while it was on Clinton Avenue, it was robbed. The only time it was ever robbed. <laughs> the thief was a local person, and he was apprehended. Um, in 1959, the officers shown there were Merle Levi, Albert Schroeder, Bernice McMichael, and Clifford Jackson, and it had about 489 members. And this is the credit union on um, 3rd Street. In the 60s, it was, uh, sometime in the 60s, it was open to the public, not just a, a company credit union any longer. It became the Riverview Community Credit Union. And then that's the new building that was built a couple of, a few years ago um, on Fredmont Highway, just inside the city limits. A fixture for many years at the credit union was Catherine McCollum. She sometimes operated as a financial administrator with some folks who had trouble handling their money. She would pay their bills, deduct the money from their account, and give them a weekly allowance. They were not to know how much they had in their savings for fear they would withdraw funds and get back into the debt. So she helped them out. And in the, mid, in the early to mid-70s, employees that were working long hours during snow and ice season couldn't always get to the credit union to cash their checks, so on payday, the phone would get passed around, and one by one, they'd let Catherine know uh, the amount of their check, and if they wanted any money deposited into savings or checking accounts or Christmas clubs or whatever. And she'd handle those transactions and then come over to the office with envelopes with their cash balance and collect their paper checks. And Catherine is still, she's in her 90s, she's still with us. She's uh, somewhere up in Port Yarn. Yeah. She's at Bears. Bears? I see her quite often. She's, oh, okay. She's where? Up in Key One. Oh. oh. At Bears? Yes, B A R E S S. Yeah. Bears. We would love to have a picture of her for the She's in a wheelchair. Yeah. But she's she's no. me. <coughs> for those of you who did not know Merle Levi, mm -hmm. uh, Merle worked for the salt company uh, in the round can department, and he was totally blind. He was president of the credit union for more years than I can remember. I'm sure for more than 20 years. He was a wonderful fellow. 
it didn't stop him. He made movies and just it was amazing what he what he accomplished. Okay, the Diamond Crystal uh, returns to the Moore family. The salt had not been a good fit for General Foods and they decided to sell it. So Charles F. Moore, the grandson of the founder of the original company, made a decision to buy back the company. There's an extra edition from the St. Clair County Press. Yeah. Does it say how much he paid for buying the bank? Uh, I don't know if I ran into that. Okay. Um, it might be in that centennial book. Um, on March 30th, 1953, Moore and members of his family bought back the assets of General Foods, Diamond Crystal Colonial Salt Division, and he became the president. At the time of the sale, Diamond Crystal Salt had 800 employees and approximately 8,000 customers at 66 General Foods plants. And there he is sitting at his desk with a graph showing an upward trend. <laughs> In the first 10 years of independence, sales rose from 10 million to 22 million and production increased from about 340 tons to a million 280 tons annually. And the work Force grew from 800 to 189. Oh, 1,089, sorry. And this is um, the beginning of the new office building up. They have to tear that white building down next to the old building, and then they've got this structure going up for the new building. And some more pictures. This is, that's the back. Yeah, the back of the building. And the new Diamond Crystal Salt Company building. Now that's where I worked when I started. Can you see the derrick in the background of that top picture? Yeah. <laughs> that was that was across Pine River from the from the property at 401 Clinton, which is at the bottom of Fourth Street. So as a kid growing up, that derrick was right across the river. On the fourth. It's, it's where the marina is today. Mm -hmm. And there's, yeah, it was, it was a nice building. Nice modern. Mm -hmm. And the packet products, Wilmington, Massachusetts was acquired in 1961. Um, packaged single serve packets of salt and pepper sold to hospitals, restaurants, and airlines. And I graduated in 1964, and I went off to Central Michigan University, and I was in the clinic there overnight for some reason. I don't know if I had the flu or whatever, but they served me a meal, and it had diamond crystal salt and pepper, and I was so homesick, and I saw that, and it was like, oh, a touch of home. <laughs> I remember seeing the pepper packet for the first time. I'm like, when did they put pepper there? I actually went to um, Wilmington, Massachusetts on vacation with a friend. Well, we went out east, but we, I wanted to stop there because uh, Claire Farrington, I talked with her on the phone all the time with my, my job that I did, and I had never met her, and so I was able to see her and, and uh, tour the facilities out there. It was really fun. In 1963 uh, fall, disposable salt and pepper shakers were sold locally. Okay, now here's the test. Al's Sausage Shop. Where's that? Clinton. I'm Clinton, right. B&E Market. Where was B&E Market? Oh. Anyway. Really know where B and E market was? Where was it, Georgina? Georgina, where was it? Ninth across from Eddie School. Okay, D. Okay, D and H. What does D and H stand for? Dick and Herbie. Dorothy and Herbie Zimmer. Okay, that was not there. Where was that? Ninth and Clinton. Ninth and Clinton. Yeah, where you get your income tax done. 
Gleams, Mar Gleams Market, everybody knows where that was. See Jerry's. Yep. Yep. Myers Meats. J Street, right. National Foods. Chumble behind, was that behind the gas station? Uh, Porter's Market, everybody knows where Porter's was. Yeah. Uh, Zach's Lock Cabin. And Tyler's Market, everybody knows where Tyler's Market was. Pool, pool and kitten dogs. Okay, now you know where everybody was. <laughs> 1957 merged with Jefferson Island Salt, Louisiana plant. Several office employees transferred to St. Clair from J.I.'s corporate offices in Kentucky, including Julian Sullivan, <laughs> Elmer Gildersleeve, Margaret Lally, who else? Julian? Russ Rudolph. Russ Rudolph. How about Whitaker Lonsdale? Yep. Okay. And Whitaker. <laughs> who else? Ed Dodd. Ed Dodd, okay. And Whitaker Lonsdale brought a secretary with him that practically dressed him, I think. She just waited, <laughs> waited on him, <laughs> hand and foot. <laughs> the, su the southern gentleman. <laughs> write that in here. No, I know I didn't write that in there. <laughs> but I remember it. <laughs> Diamond Crystal Executives touring the Jefferson Island facilities at the time of purchase in 1957. Keith Gilkey, Spence Milestrip, Ken Edwards, and Russ Rudolph. Okay, lost one lake. Mine collapse sucks barges into huge holes. November 20th, 1980, a Texaco oil rig drilling in a lake above the Jefferson Island salt mine broke through the dome of the mine at the 1,300 foot level. The mine flooded with lake water and the whirlpool created also drew in water from a shallow canal. Do you have the... Yep, I'm going to do that. Okay. The $5 million oil rig, river barges, and parts of the lake shore and lake bed were sucked into the whirlpool. The Rip Van Winkle Gardens on the shore of the lake was destroyed. Fortunately, all 48 diamond crystal miners in the mine that day were able to evacuate with, without harm. After three years of litigation, Diamond Crystal recovered $38,500,000 for the loss of the mine. <coughs> We're going to show a, a short talk. Uh, after the drill began Think about the, the drilling crew who the tragedy. abandoned the tilting rig watched in amazement from the shore as their 150 foot derrick disappeared into a lake that was less than 10 feet deep. Meanwhile, 1,300 feet below the surface of Lake Venura, the diamond crystal miners, who had not been alerted to a problem, looked up to see something you should never see in a salt mine. Water. Water flowing through salt tends to dissolve the salt. As you increase the volume of water, you increase the volume of salt that can be dissolved. Soon it was clear. Lake Manure was draining through the hole bored by the drill bit and into the salt mine. As the two and a half billion gallons of Lake Manure surged into the mine with ten times the pressure of a fire hydrant, a mighty whirlpool was forming on the surface. Remarkably, thanks to well-rehearsed evacuation drills and the heroics of several miners, all 55 people in the mine managed to get out. But back on the surface, the chaos was just beginning. The whirlpool is basically a vortex of, of water and mud that is flowing down into a fairly confined space. And that whirlpool is basically flowing downwards under the force of gravity, pulling sediment and other materials down with it. The whirlpool sucking force pulled heavy-duty barges toward it as their crews left for safety. Men watched with jaws agape as 11 barges and a tugboat disappeared into the vortex. Those are four fully loaded flatbed trucks spinning helplessly in the whirlpool. When a barge that was 
blocking the way was sucked into the hole. It gave Viator a narrow path to skirt the maelstrom. He gunned the motor and reached the shore with seconds to spare. Viator then tied his boat to a tree. When I looked like this, I seen my boat that I had tied to the tree, and there it was going into the whirlpool. So that's the last thing I seen, my boat tied up to the tree going into the hole. By that point, the whirlpool was sucking down Jefferson Island itself. Before evening, 65 acres of land, including much of Live Oak Gardens, would end up at the bottom of the mine. 150-year-old trees were snapped in half. There were pecan trees that were 150 feet tall down here in this woods. And to stand there and watch them drop completely out of sight. <laughs> yeah. Along the shoreline, along the Live Oak Gardens and the Jefferson Island Mansion, you'd basically see in what are called landslides, where the, the ground is actually shearing and breaking apart, and gravity's pulling these blocks down into the hole. Look at this over here, look! Look at that! That house that we were standing on, uh, all you see now is a chimney. The, the house sank about 30 feet. Could things get worse? Yes. Which normally flowed away from Lake Manure and into the Gulf of Mexico, actually reversed direction under the intense sucking power of the whirlpool. As the water rushed into the now nearly empty lake bed, it formed a 150-foot waterfall, the highest ever in Louisiana. But that's the only time the Gulf of Mexico flew north, basically. So that's a lot of water, and to fill that hole. As the water rushed into the mine, its rapid displacement of the underground caverns shot a deafening blast of compressed air, and later, a 400-foot geyser up from the mine shaft. To see something like this, it was terrible, really. I thought it was the end of the world. It took two days for the canal's water to fill up the mine in Lake Benure. When the water pressure equalized, nine of the 11 sunk barges popped up like corks in a bathtub. <laughs> operation and the underground salt mine were complete losses. The cause of the disaster was never officially determined, since all the evidence was at the bottom of a 1,500-foot water-filled salt mine. But there's no definitive evidence that the mine itself was structurally unsound. The culprit was most likely a 14-inch wide drill bit. This engineering disaster did have at least one positive effect. It made Lake Panure a little more interesting. <laughs> it's a shallow lake. And now we have part of it's a deep lake. So it's changed the type of fish that live in the lake. And we catch a redfish and saltwater species that were not very prevalent here before. But not everyone is planning a fishing trip to Lake Panure. <laughs> what I went through and got out of there alive, I don't, I don't care for it. Really? I prefer buying my fish. <laughs> 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 the loss of livelihoods and cherished property was devastating. Yet the fact that no human beings perished was fortunate indeed. For if there's one lesson to take from this strange engineering disaster, it's that a small mistake can have huge consequences. I think the amazing thing about that was that they had become so well trained after Gail Petrick, who came from this area and went there to be the manager. He had trained so well in, in mine disasters that everybody got out of there uh, before all the water rushed in. News. You're going to hear from a bulldozer operator who found himself sucked into a hole Sorry about that. on a piece I thought I did that already. Okay, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm no, no, no. Go one. ahead. Go ahead, Mel. Well, all I was saying was that Gail Petrick, who had come from here, uh, had gone to Jefferson Island to become the, the manager. And when he got there, he really worked intently on safety precautions and getting out of the mine and that sort of thing. And it was... I give him an awful lot of credit for the years that he spent 
training those guys to get out of there. Uh, because when two guys would go down in the morning and uh, just check around the big electrical gear and that sort of thing before anybody else came down. And when they got there uh, at that electrical area, one of them saw, thought he saw something moving. And so they went and looked and it was sort of gravelly like stuff floating along. And so they immediately went over and hit the, hit the uh, alarm three times, which meant everybody get out. And they had trained them well enough that everybody got out of there. Nobody was lost. That's amazing. So how far <laughs> under were they? It said, and this is 1700 feet. 1700 feet. I guess that's true. Right? What year was this? 1980. That's just 1,300 feet low. Do you think Gail Petrick is still alive, Mill? Well, I'm pretty sure he is. Okay, okay. And he's the son-in-law of Ed Gregg that drilled the salt that's, wells around that's here. correct, yes. And on the back of this newspaper article is a whole big write-up on who might have shot Jr. <laughs> in case you wondered what else was going on. In the world. <laughs> that, um, in one of the pamphlets we have over there about the disaster, and um, it said that the J.I. property was purchased in 1918 as a winter vacation spot by Kentucky businessman J. Lyle Bayless. And he, a couple of years later, he sank the, the mine shaft into the salt dome and founded the J.I. Uh, Jefferson Island Salt Company, um, which, um, and then his son, J. Lyle Bayless Jr. sold the company to Diamond Crystal in 1956, um, but after the disaster, apparently Bayless Jr. had lost his house or, or buildings or whatever, but he hired scuba divers to um, go down and retrieve the contents of his wine cellar. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't going to let those bottles of wine go to waste down there. Yeah. In that video clip, you may have recognized brief, briefly a Sinclair resident, Bob Markle. Uh, Bob went to Jefferson Island when Gail Petrick did, and he, I think he was maintenance superintendent, but he was Sinclair resident. What was he talking about? Which guy was he on there? Uh, he was one toward the end of the video who talked about the, uh, uh, the destruction around the, the mine itself. Mm -hmm. was right after you saw the geyser come up through the okay. uh, shaft. Uh, so this is the newspaper here that, um, you know, from the Times Herald, so it was the local news. And if you flip that over, what else was going on at that time? <laughs> uh, the whole page was full of um, the suspects for who shot J.R. Oh. 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 Okay. 1980. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, the Bahamas solar plant began in 1961. It takes seven years to extract salt through this process, and the first shipment started on November 11, 1968. Uh, harvester at the plant removes 400 tons of salt per hour from each of 13 crystallizers or salt beds. Trailers carry the salt to the process plant where it is washed, dried, and stored for shipment to chemical manufacturers um, chlorine and caustic soda, and government agencies for snow and ice removal on the U.S. East Coast. In 1963, Diamond Crystal Salt introduced Hybu, which is a medicated ingredient, which was a source of iodine for livestock. It prevents, prevented foot rot, goiter, and lumpy jaw in cattle. March 11, 1965, um, saw fire in the office attic, causing $50,000 in damages. Um, D.C. Salt, uh, St. Clair Fire Department, and Marysville Fire Department fought this fire. 
The cause was an electrical fire in the walls. Um, Ed, Edward M. Dodd was using his dictaphone when it went dead and there were no lights. So he, so he and another employee opened the door to the attic and they smelled smoke and, and sent off the alarm. Many files were stored in the attic. Um, ironically, the St. Clair Historical Commission had a meeting scheduled for that evening in the Diamond Pistol conference room, which probably was canceled <laughs> or relocated. Um, Charles F. Moore retired as president um, March 1st, 1971, after 40 years with the company. And he's shown there with Ed, Ed Dodd. We have this program over here for you to look at, Dinner in Honor of Charles F. Moore. Probably ought to add that Ed Dodd came from Jefferson. the Jefferson Island operation. Okay, Ed Dodd just came like from... Julie just, just like Julian did. Just like Julian. They were buddies. Yeah. <laughs> but Julian didn't get to be president, darn. <laughs> and then when you read that program over there, the guest list, you'll, you'll know those people. <clears throat> President, President Nixon, who was not at his retirement party, we just had to use this great picture someplace. <laughs> There's the back of the retirement program. Remember the Diamond Star? That's Charlie Moore and his new bride. The Charles F. Moore Boat Harbor, 1970. The old DPW on this side of the river. Things have changed. Shortly after urban renewal, so you can see there's hardly any trees in the mm -hmm. park. I should mention, because Roger Campbell is gone. Charlie Moore was, of course, the harbor master when they were starting to build this. And Roger and I had both gotten our professional engineering licenses together. And so Charlie called me over one day and he asked me if every evening before we went home we'd walk around and talk to the contractor and make sure they were following <laughs> the plans for the, for the boat harbor here. And we did that. Yay. For most of the summer. And then a few years later, Roger died. So. Roger who? Campbell. Campbell. Oh, right. oh, I didn't know Roger Campbell died. Okay. Okay. Sorry. So the boat houses that we saw earlier, the small boat houses, those were along there. Were yes. they mostly moved or were they taken down and there were oh, other they, ones? They were there? gone. They, they were, were just demolished. They were gone. No, well. The one that belonged to my father-in-law and husband, they took that along the ice, and Alice bought it, and he took it out. It's bought by the old marina. I don't know for sure about some of the other boathouses. Okay. People probably remember better than I do about that. But Edward Dodd was president from 71 to 75, his death. Under Dodd's leadership, company sales rose to more than $51 million in 1975. As a result of a major modernization program begun in 1973, new products were developed. DuraCube, a table-grade salt compressed into chunks and designed for home water softener use. E equipment to make ketchup for use by packet products. The these Dichromat. Dichromat, salt analyzer for use in the food processing. Charles Cronworth was president from 1975 to 1985. He was president when I was there. Um, between 1975 and 1980, sales rose to 82 million with profits of 6.5 million. Capital improvements were made at all plants. Uh, 1985 salt sense was introduced. This product contains less sodium per volume than regular salt. 
And this was uh, an article talking about the the um, old office building, which was going to be demolished. And there it is, being demolished. In 1985, Charles Cronowitz retired after 39 years of service, and Roy C. Satchel was named president. Um, and the next year, in 1986, Diamond Crystal celebrated 100 years. And this is the placard that is uh, just outside the town. So that'd be 86, right? 86. And some advertising of Diamond Crystal salt. We've got some ads that were... <laughs> well, first of all, um, grocers in the days when they used to make house calls, they advertised Diamond Crystal on the salt on the sides of their wagons and in their shop windows. Yep. This is not St. Clair, though. It's not St. Clair, but you can see that the dark um, sign there on the side does say diamond crystal salt. So they must have been delivering somewhere else besides St. Clair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a delivery truck promoting the Diamond Crystal line. That's all so. And the Shaker Girl was, uh, looks modernized in this picture. Yeah, with the purchase of two packages of Diamond Crystal and Shaker Girl. <laughs> And these were um, little uh, salt dishes with sellers, sellers with uh, spoons that you could get for for a dollar. So if you if you ever see that design at estate sales, that square, it almost yeah. looks like the ashtrays. Yeah. 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 With that with that little bit of a shell spoon, mm -hmm. those are diamond crystal ones. So mm -hmm. pick them up if you see them at any yeah. sales. Yeah, I've seen those. yeah and they go for a lot more than four for a dollar. <laughs> Just the spoons alone can go for twelve dollars a piece. Wow. And these bowls on the bottom had diamond crystals. That's still tall. Oh. <laughs> these I I found a lot on eBay, and I actually use them at home. Um, they're a good size. Um, but yeah, that was also uh, also a giveaway and. Uh, the green depression, depression grass, it's Vaseline, um, so that has, that's more of a value. Those will go from anywhere from 10 to $30 for the green ones. <laughs> the, and I wish they would advertise this more um, because this really, hits home on how important diamond crystal salt is. You've eaten corn on the cob and you put, if you put Morton on it, the little cubes bounce off. Mm -hmm. Not only do they bounce <coughs> off, but by the time, when you put it up to your mouth, they're no, they're not gone. They're, you're still getting bits of hard salt. Oh. And, you know, and so this is the best recommendation for <laughs> diamond crystal because when you salt it, by the time it gets up to your mouth, those crystals have dissolved and you taste the enhanced corn. You're not eating bits of hard salt. Mm -hmm. So that's, and that's why all the companies, that's why Lay's Potato Chips, that's why all these companies prefer Diamond Crystal Salt because it's available, easier to put on um, your chips. So yeah, about the, the multifaceted crystal adheres to the chips um, and snack foods. And um, these ads were found in um, book uh, magazines, I think even Life magazines from about 1937. Mm -hmm. There's some products that uh, are um, contained that use diamond crystal salt products. They're McDonald's French fries. That's an empty container there. This is a display that we have up in the diamond crystal room so that the kids make a connection between the salt being produced in St. Clair and what they eat every day. And 
and a look at some Diamond Crystal Salt Company employees and families. So we have an article, oh, well, a company could never be a company uh, survive for 130 years without its greatest assets as employees. Hard work, good times, bad times, all memories made. We wish we could include everyone's story. Um, we have a nice article, which I think we have a shot of it here, that uh, lists um, like fathers and sons and their start dates and how many years. Um, oh, oh, this is a Cheryl family. Often family members over generations worked at Diamond Crystal Salt, spouses, parents, and children. The Cheryl family, fathers and three sons, is an example from 1961. And there is Clinton Cheryl, second to the left, and his three sons, Don, Gordon, and George. And together they have a total of 63 years service. And that's, this is the article we have over on the table on your to your left there, um, if you want to get a closer up look at it, it's got a lot of um, families that you probably recognize and, you know, fathers and sons or daughters. And we had um, several couples that worked, um, just a few, Stan and Noreen Schreiner. Um, I worked with Noreen. Um, Gordon and May Wolven, Edgar and Doreen Fandrick, Harold and Jean Swain, I worked with both of them, Art and Helen Boda, um, I actually, um, when Helen retired, I took her spot in the credit department, Merle and Burl Levi. I think that was somebody that was the laws is the only boy. Yeah. I think that was an uncle. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean when it says son, it's yeah. Yeah. Right. So the numbers to the right, is that the year they started at Diamond? Is that what that means? I think so, yeah. Yeah, because like Clarence Blaine starts in twenty four and his son starts in forty six. Yeah. I don't know how many here remember that I think it was six o'clock every morning the diamond crystal yeah. whistle yeah. would blow yeah. to, to wake up the employees and <laughs> tell them they had an hour to get to work. Yeah. And everybody would walk down the street with their lunch box. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now we yeah, we had um, that was brought up that it blew. Do you know how many times a day it blew? Did it blow like at noon and after work or it blew in the morning, it blew at noon and then it when it was time to go to home. go home. Mm -hmm. Here's the softball league. Elger and Bill Bark, Art Ellery, John Fleury, Charles Olette, Backrow, Merle Wester, Clyde Springborn, Lauren e. Hollis, Bud Hornberger, Roy Clutcho. Absent was Duke English. <laughs> and this was a bowling team. Vera McCormick was on that. Sophie Mark Lloyd, Aggie Clemmer, Rags Fraley, Harvey Scott. Okay, where do you suppose this was? 1948, picnic. Marysville Park, that's what I think. But does anybody really know? I across the street. Mary, I did some Googling yesterday and there were there was a creek that ran through Marysville Park called Bud Creek. Okay. And Bud, there was a sawmill back in the eighteen hundreds at the where Huron would be now and they utilized that creek to go out to the river. So, mm -hmm. And I did talk to a friend of mine whose father worked 
that diamond back in the 40s, when she was born in 40s and 52, and she remembers going to Marysville Park for picnics. Right. It's a great deal. So, mm -hmm. kind of thinking about her. The water plant in Marysville. Yeah. 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 Well, Sue Sean Weber, whose father Oscar worked there, apparently she said Marysville Park. So, and she was born in 1940 or something, so she probably went to the picnic. Plus, look at all the people there. What other park could really accommodate? Right. You know? They were having fun. The tug of war. There's the same picture. Diamond Crystal Lassie's St. Clair League Championship. Uh, Lucille Koenig. Margaret Collins. Walt well, well Gothier, manager. Hill the Gothals. Florence Conant. Marie Bars. Hazel Boucher. Hazel Bostic. Eleanor English. Harriet Rood. Margaret Collins. Marcella Raddatz and Sophie McLeod. Sophie's the one on the far right in the back. <coughs> Walt Gothier, employee for 16 years, and his 14-year-old son at that time, Fred, caught 12 fish in less than three hours one day recently. Walt has displayed an eight and a half pound pickerel. Fred's stir string ranges from one to five pounds. Father and son are seen constantly together along the St. Clair River. That's an old picture. Okay, here's another old picture. Bowling team, Teresa Muro, Betty Brenner. Betty Brenner is here. <laughs> Sophie McLeod, Charlie Moore, Teresa Williams, Lynn Kors, Oh my goodness, that's quite the group. Nineteen fifty DC bowling team. Josephine George, front row. Teresa Muro. Catherine O'Grady. Doreen Muro. Vera McCormick. Everybody knows Vera McCormick. Back row, Milton Gehring, Clyde Springborn, Ed Allman, Carl Richter, Albert Schroeder, Clint Sherrill, and Harold Rankin. 1958, they were growing their beards for the St. Clair Centennial. Walt Gauthier, Ed Allman, Bud Beach, Roy Team, Bob Gunn, <clears throat> Bill Stockwell, and Dallas Bollier. Art Ellery in the front. And then standing, Ed Kennedy, my cousin, who I was going to say is still alive, but he died last Friday. Tomorrow on his 92nd birthday, he'll be buried in Minnesota. So anyway, he was the last one to die from that group. And then there's uh, Gordy Woven down there, <coughs> kneeling. And his daughter is here tonight. Extra bits of diamond crystal salt history. Coal pile with snow on it. If you look in the upper right, that's the Oakland Hotel. What is it? The Oakland Hotel. Diamond. You know where you know where the road curves and there's Jets Pizza and there's the three more homes. This is that's the that's the southernmost. Yeah. On the more homes are on the south side. Well, the, they were also more homes. There's more homes in the north, but yeah. This was I think this was the one that was a duplex. Didn't Mary live in part of it? Mary that went to Congregational Church. So. Here's an older picture because you see, is that the Sherman, the Sherman House? Yeah. 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 
Looks like a streetcar or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. The inner yeah. urban. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, what you were saying, the whistle at Diane Crystal blew three times a day then, at 6 a.m. at noon and after the shift was over. Diamond Crystal used to make their own power. Um, during the 1980s, Saltwell's um, over in the like CBS area, Fredmore Highway area, they were cemented and there's there's two wells now that are on South Range Road. Um, kosher salt is only made in St. Clair, um, and a rabbi still comes in and blesses the plant on a regular basis. Um, back in the days of the switchboard operator, um, she'd have an auto, uh, an auto call system. Everybody, managers and supervisors and so forth, had a number, and she had needed to get hold of them there in the plant. She would just uh, bring that number um, to, to summon them. And there was a fire, firemen that were in the um, plant, and so if, she, if they needed to respond to a call in the city or whatever, she would ring three times. The fire brigade at the plant was discontinued under EXO. Um, and then we had Max Dubois, who in the 1940s became buried in a coal pile, but he was saved. <laughs> And there's um, Ed Gregg and Ed Kaiser. They were repairing a salt well, 1953. And there was a cafeteria in the plant um, with uh, home-cooked meals and, and baked goods. Uh, the cooks there were shown are Margaret Dare, Florence Kirbin, Catherine Dandrin, and Laura Black. And um, we happened to have the chocolate or cocoa drop cookie recipe that they made back there. And I, I made a batch of those up so they're over on the table there. You can sample there are recipes that you can take. Um, in March 31st, 1959, it was replaced by vending machines. And we have somebody here in the audience today, Vera LaMarche, who used to work in the cafeteria. I talked with her yesterday. <laughs> she said all she did was wash dishes, but she met her husband here, and he was a jitney driver, so I said, you must have come, up, come out of the kitchen once in a while for him to meet you. <laughs> Did you get any of the other recipes? <laughs> like your cake milk cookies? No. In 1961, the six-point diamond star symbol was designed to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the company. Uh, there were dinners that were held around town and, and different churches, and the employees and spouses uh, were um, given a program held at the St. Clair High School following the dinners. Um, the Diamond Crystal also went from a privately owned company in 1961 to a public company. And here are, there are estimated 14,000 uses for non-dietary dietary salt. And there's a chart, so study it because there's a test afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was so cool when they put the cans. Yeah, the yeah, that's yeah, that's the old um, yeah. the old shaker can which came down. I'm not sure when, but I liked it though. With the spout. 
That's the one I remember. Yeah. 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 yeah, the other, the new one's going up there. That was nice. They put that up for the sesquicentennial. Yeah. The smokestacks built in 1951 came down in late 2015. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See all the safety equipment they got up there. Mm -hmm. After a hundred years, there was to be a change in the ownership of Diamond Crystal Salt. Assets of the company were transferred to AXO International as of April 25, 1987. The transition period took place over the next approximately 30 months, at which time the St. Clair office was closed and operations moved to Clark Summit, Pennsylvania. And that's Bud Beach in the office in um, office services. And I was there at that time. Um, we had, you know, a lot of uh, over that 30 months. There were some on-site and off-site you know, gatherings, just um, to kind of commiserate, all, you know, remember old times. And, and he's actually, uh, if you, this is for. Dick Thompson, he's actually, Bud's actually holding a memo that you faxed to him to read to everybody, and I have that memo. I've kept it all these years. I'm going to read it just a minute. <laughs> is that where it's black balloons? That's what I was going to say. Is that where those black balloons? Yeah. Aww. And there's Sally Polly Agus pulling the plug. A hundred and or 1886 to 2016, 130 years. It's been called, owned by or called uh, Saint Clair Rock Salt Company, Diamond Crystal Salt, General Foods, Diamond Crystal Salt Company, Moore Family, Axo Salt, and Cargill. But it'll always be known as the Diamond. <laughs> Yeah, uh, there are um, people that helped put this together. We talked to, we got information from Steve McCartney, Julian Sullivan, Bob LaDuke, um, Joanne Heiss, um, who is here today, um, Ann Heiss, um, Schulte, who uh, brought in some of her father's things. Uh, Dr. Heiss was an engineer. Um, Jim Dandrin, Barb Hyja, Sue Kaufman. Sue And museum members who helped with the research, um, Chuck Comper, Chrissy Gorzen, and um, the rest is some pictures there, including I took a few. Thank you. So sorry about that. So I have, um, if we can get the lights, I will go up and read that memo. And then we'll end the program and you can eat. How about, how about the drawing? All oh, the drawings coming up. Okay, so this is this is a dry or a memo that was sent uh, faxed over to Bud Beach from Dick Thompson, who was in Pennsylvania at the time. And uh, it says, Dear Bud and cast of many, oh how I wish I could be with you all for the last of the best. I will be with you in spirit even though I can't come home for the last hurrah. The last year has been emotional for us all. For some of us, it has meant extraordinary hard work and uprooting of families. For others, it has meant the apprehension of seeing, seeking new jobs and getting adjusted to a new set of business colleagues. For a few, retirement of some sort or other has been a joy. As we say the final goodbye to good old Diamond Crystal, we all know that life does indeed go on. Give thanks for the memories and look forward to the future with happy anticipation. Thank you all for your friendship, your dedication to the jobs that were, and especially for seeing us through the difficult integration phase. We will remember you always. Keep in mind that you have lots of friends in Pennsylvania. Best wishes, Dick Thompson. Very nice.